Well, this morning, we're going to talk about waking up the dead. This morning's sermon is called Wake Up the Dead Now. And if you would, please stand with me. Last week, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This week, we're going to be talking about the resurrection of the saints. And this should get your, your fire going right here. Our passage this morning comes for, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And you'll find the scriptures up on the screen. Or if you brought your Bible this morning, you can open up your Bible and read through with us. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 states, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others with, who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And listen to this. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And this morning, I pray that this message is comforting to you as we look at the resurrection of the saints. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and the promise that you have throughout all throughout your word from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Thank you for showing us in your word that Jesus is coming back soon and that we need to be ready. And I pray for those in this place this morning and those listening by DVD or by the Internet that today would be the day of salvation, that today would be a day of an encouragement for them. We pray for comfort for those that have lost loved ones, for they've lost husbands and wives and, and, and brothers and sisters and children. I thank you for the comforting words that are in your word and the fact that those that knew you, we will see again. And Father, we thank you again for Jesus. We love you and praise you. We open up our hearts to you this morning and we ask that you would speak to us. I ask for your anointing to rush through this place. And we, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. I'll tell you a quick story about a guy named Morris. He was worried because his wife Brenda was very ill and needed a, a good doctor. And Dr. Myers was the best doctor in the city, so Morris went and asked him to treat his wife Brenda. Dr. Myers said, okay, but can you afford me? What if I'm unable to save Barbara and you decide not to pay my bills? And Morris responds, I promise to pay you whether you cure Barbara or kill her. So Dr. Myers agreed to treat Barbara. You all see where this is going already, don't you? And unfortunately, Barbara died. When Dr. Myers' invoice arrived, Morris refused to pay despite his promise, and the doctor took the bill before the judge. And after reviewing the agreement, the judge asked, so did you cure her? And the doctor said, no. The judge said, did you kill her? The doctor said, no, I certainly did not. In that case, says the judge, Morris owes you nothing. You fulfilled neither of the conditions on which you agreed as your fees should be paid. <laughs> There's another lady, a lady named Carol. Now, this is a true story. This lady named Carol, and it's not our Carol here, but a lady named Carol went to, uh, she had a recent experience in which she went to a home Bible study and, in someone's home, and during the lesson, the teacher stated that there was no such thing as a rapture. Now, we believe in the rapture, and when Carol objected, the teacher was so bold as to say, I'll give you $5,000 if you can give me a scripture that proves that there is a rapture. So imagine yourself in this position. What would you do? What would you say? Everyone is looking at you and expecting you to come up with scriptures to defend your beliefs. What would you say in this circumstance? Would you be flummoxed in what you would answer, what answer you're going to give them or what they're asking you? How would you handle this question or this challenge? Well, this morning, I hope to give you that information and to show you from the scripture that there's biblical proof of the rapture of the church. Now, obviously, I believe this with all my heart, and I look forward to that soon rapture, the catching away of the bride. And we'll get into, well, where's the word rapture found in the Bible? Guess what? I'm going to let you know ahead of time. It is not found in there. But you believe in the rapture? Absolutely. And I'll show you why. So first of all, let's find out what the rapture is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 6, verse 17, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself, who? That's right. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet of God, a call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive, still alive, and are left will be caught up together, and there's our key word right there, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's good enough news right there to start shouting. Amen? I mean, that just gets, that gives me Holy Ghost goosebumps when I read that scripture. Why? Because life, sometimes life is just hard. 
we all go through things. Some people may be going through something at work, and you're just like, I can't, I don't want to face tomorrow. But I'm going to tell you this, we have, there's good news in this. And the fact that even though tomorrow's on its way, Jesus is too. Amen? We've got good news in the Word of God. The, the word rapture means to snatch up, to seize, to carry off by force, to rapture. The word often denotes an emotion of a sudden, uh, the, the emotion of a sudden swoop and, and usually that of force that cannot be resisted. In other words, when it happens, it's going to happen fast. In another scripture, it says in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And GE did a study uh, back in the 60s and found out that that is one, if I remember this correctly, one one hundredth of a second. That's how fast the rapture is going to happen. It's not going to be one of these slow ding. But rather, it's going to happen so fast that we're going to be here and then there in the clouds with the Lord. We're like, oh, there won't be enough time for you to grab hold of the heathen standing next to you to tell them on the way up, well, you want to get saved now? I mean, it's just, it always just happened that fast. Amen? So a sudden snatching away. And an example of this Greek word's use is seen in Acts 8.39, when the Holy Spirit physically took Philip away from the Ethiopian to be found later in a town of Azotos. Listen, Philip was, was standing with an Ethiopian. First of all, the Lord told Philip, he said, go down to this road and meet. There's going to be a person there. Go up to the chariot and listen. And he's, he went up. The, the Ethiopian was reading out loud. He was, he's like, I don't understand this passage from Isaiah. It was this, as the writer talking of himself or of somebody else. And Philip said, I can explain. And he invited him. The Ethiopian invited him onto the chariot. And they rode along. And Philip opened up the scriptures to this Ethiopian. And then he talked about baptism. And the Ethiopian was like, look, here's some water. Why don't I get baptized now? Man, talk about a salvation experience. Absolutely. Philip said, if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? And he say, basically, he, he led him in a, in a gift, a way of salvation. And he baptized the Ethiopian there alongside the road. And when Philip had brought him up out of the water, immediately the spirit took him away from that point. The spirit's like, Whoosh. and I can only imagine Philip's response when he got to the, 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 the town of Astos. He's like, Whoa. Can you imagine standing in water? You just baptized somebody, and the next thing you're standing in a town that's way far away. That's awesome. But that's how the rapture is going to be. And it's snatching away. We're going to be standing. You may be standing, whether you're at work. I mean, can, can you imagine if you're at work? Let's, let's take a profession here. My brother works in a dental profession. I can imagine him working on something, and all of a sudden he's holding a denture, and he's, he's cleaning that thing. Boom, he's gone. And if it just drops to the ground and he's standing in the presence of the Lord or, or somebody riding a motorcycle, just enjoying themselves with the wind in their face and their hair flowing. As they're leaning into a curve and all of a sudden that trumpet sounds and poof, they're gone. That precious bike just goes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How about a pilot? Oh, my goodness. Now we're talking. There's an airline that when they hire a pilot, if they tell, if they profess to be a Christian, they purposely put a non-Christian co-pilot with them. Just in case if the rapture's true. Well, it is true. I mean, I can imagine different, somebody washing a car, you know, they're, they're standing there holding the hose and then poof, they're gone and the hose just drops. And I'm sure you've seen different movies that depict visions of what the rapture would be. But what I want you to understand is the fact that it's going to happen fast. There won't be time to repent. If the rapture happens, there won't be time to repent to, to catch uh, up in the air. Amen? It's just going to happen that fast. And that's where we're called to live lives of holiness and righteousness before the Lord. It's, um, it, it's when it, 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 there will be a rapture. It's coming. And there won't be a countdown to when it happens either. It'll just happen. Christ, another definition of rapture is Christ's sudden, brief, and unannounced coming in the air to catch away his church before the day of God's wrath begins. Jesus returns to heaven with his saints for the believer's judgment and the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is a meal being prepared for them that believe in heaven right now. There is a table, and I'm, I'm going to imagine this is a very large table, a very long table. That Jesus will sit at the head and we will sit there with him, not at the head, but, but along with other brothers and sisters in Christ, those that have gone on before us, those that will go with us. Amen. But that meal is being prepared for them that believe. And we'll get to sit down and eat with the, the Lamb of God who took away our sins. That's glorious news there. That is wonderful news. The Greek word... Harpazo, or harpazo, I know I'm butchering that. Those of you that, that love the Greek, I'm sorry. 
It's used in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, is translated as caught up. And it was translated into the Latin Vulgate as raptus, from where we get our English word rapture, okay? And let's talk about the concept of being evacuated. John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house has many rooms or many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Jesus made a promise to the disciples. And as disciples of Christ, as followers of Christ, that promise is applicable to our lives as well. And the fact that he has gone to prepare a place for us. And in his father's house are many mansions, many places of dwelling. Amen. We have a mansion in heaven with the father when we become a believer. Now, your works will work on your good works are also be rewarded as well. That's why we want to work on our good works here while we're here on this earth. Because we can't do anymore once we get into heaven. We'll be serving one another, yes, but our good works that what we get graded on for eternity, I guess you could say, happens here and now. The Lord cited the rescue of Lot and his family from Sodom before judgment fell. As a, a, This is another indication of the rapture of the church. You've got angels that come into Sodom and Gomorrah, and they find Lot and his wife and his, his kids, and they, they say, you've got to come with us now. And they took them by force out of the city. Why? Because the God's wrath was coming. And it's the same way. This is a, a type of the rapture of the church. Another one was Jesus talked about the ten virgins. There were five that were foolish and five that were wise. The five wise kept the oil within them. We are to be filled continually with who? The Holy Spirit. That's right. The Holy Spirit is represented by oil in the Bible. We're to be continually filled and walking in God's love. We want to make sure that our lamps are full and burning bright for the King of kings and Lord of lords for when the bridegroom comes to take away his bride. Amen. So why we believe in the rapture is our second point this morning. First one is that Jesus said he's coming back. And how many know when Jesus makes a promise, he keeps that promise? Amen? He made a promise that he's coming back. Early in his ministry in Luke 4, 18, Jesus told Jewish leaders that he had come to heal the sick. They didn't believe he could, and he healed the people anyways. And then Jesus told them he could drive out demons. They didn't believe he could, and he did it anyways. And then he told them he would rise up from the dead, and they didn't believe he would. His body was wrapped in grave clothes. His body was anointed for burial. It had been pierced and broken for us. It had been striped. It was dead. A heavy stone was laid in front of the tomb so that nobody could roll away that stone. Soldiers were posted outside the tomb to guard it, and they even put a seal on top of it. And that door was sealed so that it wouldn't open. But yet no human and no supernatural force could stop the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He rose from the grave. And that's what we celebrated last week. And this week we're celebrating the fact that he made the promise that one day the dead in Christ will rise again and we will rise with them. That's good news. The same Jesus told us, he said, I'm coming back. Or in our day and age, we would want to say, I'll be back. Amen. According to Pastor John Gaston, there's 52 prophecies of Jesus' second coming. That's 535 verses. Some say that there's up to a third of the Bible is dedicated to the return of Christ. We could look at the beginning. This is fascinating. We, we studied out a few weeks ago. We looked at the first sentence in the Bible, in the Word of God. In the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth, right? And we looked at the, the, the words that barashit, and it went on. We looked at the word barashit as well. And barashit itself, the very first word of the Bible, talks about the Son of God coming to die upon the cross to redeem mankind. And that's it in a nutshell. But also within the first seven words of the Bible, we have ages represented too. And in the fourth age, that word talks of the coming of Christ. And in the sixth age, it talks of the return of Christ. That's in the first the sentence of the Bible. It's fascinating in the Hebrew. Jesus made a promise, not only when he his lifetime, but he even promised it before he came to the earth. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus said he's coming back. Um, there are people that, today that like to make fun of the idea of the rapture. And it doesn't help when you have people like Harold Camping, who've made a mockery of it. But um, Jesus is coming back. And all the powers of heaven or hell, our armies or nuclear missiles can't stop him. You know, we, we do wish he'd come back sooner. It's kind of like 
a fella named Uncle Pete, he had to wait in a long line to get to see his doctor. And when the doctor finally saw him, the doctor apologized for the wait, and Uncle Pete said, it's okay, I just thought you might prefer treating my ailment in its earlier stages. Yep. Here's another interesting thing is that Paul thought he wouldn't die. It's, it's another interesting proof that the rapture is what Paul believed in. It's possible, he thought it was possible he would never die. And, and he thought he was going to be translated probably like Enoch or taken away like Elijah. He says this. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in the flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed forever. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 54. For the Lord himself will come out from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, a call of God, and the dead in Christ will be raised first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So what Paul was saying, listen, we that are alive will be caught up. That's how soon he thought the rapture was taking place. That was 2,000 years ago. Guess what? We are 2,000 years closer to the rapture of the church. We are 2,000 years closer to going and be home, to be home with the Father in heaven. And here's an interesting contrast as well. People say, well, what about the book of Revelation? Doesn't it talk about, um, you know, the, the, what's the difference between Revelation and the rapture of here? And I'm going to tell you this. In, in the rapture, Jesus comes, and there should be a chart up here. He comes to the clouds. It talks about he comes to the clouds. In Revelation, Jesus comes down to the Mount of Olives. When it, the return, I should say, the return of Christ. He comes down to the Mount of Olives, and he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. He does that, and it splits, and it opens up the eastern gate so that he can walk through. See, the eastern gate sealed shut. It was sealed shut back in the 1500s. The Turks, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire come in there. They concreted the door closed. They heard about the prophecy of the Christ coming back through the eastern gate, and they thought, mm -mm, not on our watch. That's not going to stop Jesus. You think a concrete wall is going to stop him? Death couldn't even stop him. So anyways, next thing, Jesus is headed to heaven with the saints with, concerning the rapture of the church. With the return, Jesus is headed to the earth with the saints. Are you with me so far? So in the rapture, he comes to the cloud, and the saints come up to join him in the clouds. With the return, Jesus is coming with the saints from heaven to the earth. You say, well, is it possible he just does a U-turn? No. That's not what the scripture teaches. The rapture first, we're in heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then after that seven-year tribulation, we're headed back down. In the rapture, Jesus comes like a thief in the night. In the return, every eye will see him. Mm, that's right. Every eye is going to see the King of kings and Lord of lords. In the rapture of the church, Jesus comes for his saints, and the, the uh, return of Christ, Jesus comes with his saints. These clear differences point out that the coming of Christ was expected in two phases. His secret coming to take his church out of the world, out of the world before the wrath of God fell, and the open coming of Christ to judge the world, to set up his government here on earth, to set up that millennial reign of Christ. You see, after that rapture, there's coming a thousand year period of perfect government where Christ is the head, and we rule and reign with him. And then there's the promise escape from wrath as well it's concerning the rapture of the church. John 3, 36, the wrath of God is for unbelievers, not for the righteous. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, is the divine agenda for the saints does not include wrath. If you like, what wrath is that we're talking about? You can see Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17 for that. And Luke 21, 34 through 36, we're to watch and pray that we might escape the awful things which are coming to the earth described in this chapter. Listen, if we're escaping something, does that mean we go through it? No. We're called to pray and watch so that we can escape that wrath to come. Revelation 3.10, the Lord's promise is to keep his saints from or out of, not in the hour of temptation or tribulation. And then we have the restrainer as well. The church was born on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit came down on the believers. And the coming of the Holy Spirit, united, uniting factor between the Jews, it united the Jews and the Gentiles, brought them together, and it forms a new family of God. Second Thessalonians 2, 6 through 8 tells us of the Holy Spirit uh, or, or the, as the restrainer or the church, either the Holy Spirit or the church or restrainer, will be taken out of this world before the Antichrist is revealed. Whether you believe the restrainer is the Holy Spirit or the church, any way you look at it, the restrainer or the church has to be out of here because the restrainer is the one who is holding back the spirit of the Antichrist. 
So in order for the, the spirit of the Antichrist to be fully revealed, for the Antichrist to be revealed, the restrainer, whether that's the church or the Holy Spirit, has to be removed out of this earth. And, and either way you look at it, if it's the Holy Spirit, guess who's, where the Holy Spirit dwells? On the inside of us, right? So if he's out of here, guess who goes with him? We do. If it's the church that's a restrainer, then it, still the church has to be out of here. Either way, the church goes. That's awesome. That's good news for us. It gives us something to look forward to. It's kind of like, you know, when you know vacation's coming, you know that, and, and when you go to work, and work may be even a bad week, but yet you know that vacation's around the bend. Friday is coming. I'll be out of here. I'll be on my motorcycle with the wind in my hair. No, I don't own a motorcycle. I'm just saying, you know, if you, and, but you're going to be on that way to vacation, to the beach or to the mountains or to Disney World or wherever that is. It's the same way when we start looking at the good news of the rapture of the church, it gives us something to look forward to. It gives us something as believers to say, yes, though I live in this fallen world, even though I live in this fallen body, I have something to look forward to. I have hope. It is the hope within me. It is Christ in me that gives me hope, and it's the glory that I get to look forward to. Peter, I think it was, one of the disciples talked about, that was Jesus, I'm sorry, a grain of wheat. He talks about a kernel of corn going into the ground. It has to die first. But then it produces much fruit, right? Much, and you realize that when you plant a kernel of corn, when it grows up and it comes out of the ground, it doesn't produce a kernel of corn, does it? It does something that produces even more glorious than what it was. And it's the same way with Jesus' body. When he died and come, rose again, he gave us something more glorious. When we repent of our sins, when our bodies die, we go into something even more glorious. You see, when that kernel of, of corn or wheat dies, it goes into the ground, and then it gets watered. It dies itself, and it gets watered, and it grows, and, and life comes back into it again. And it turns into a stalk, and then that stalk produces ears and, and more seeds, and it produces even more than what it was in its previous form. That's the same way with us. We've got, there's good news there. There's a source of comfort from trouble. First Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. Verse 18 says that knowledge of the rapture comforts the church. The, listen, the rapture would not be comforting if we knew we had to go through wrath. Amen. In that case, it would seem better just to die first. Uh, Titus 2, 13 so the rapture of the Christians is the blessed hope, something that brings joy and happiness to believers in the now. And then uh, there's a requires with this thought requires a pre-tribulation rapture as well. Mark 13, 32, if the rapture were to, either in the middle or the close of the, the tribulation, the saints would know the day, if not the hour of the, tri of the rapture of the church. In other words, no man knows the day or the hour when, when that takes place. But if we know the beginning of the tribulation time, then we would know exactly when the rapture would take place. Does that make sense? If it were a mid or post tribulation type thing. Um, And figuring, well, anyways, you, you would know when the man of sin would be revealed. There's also, an, there's a, this necessitates a, an interval time as well. There must be an interval between the rapture and the second coming of Christ because the bride is in the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. In heaven, we are celebrating before the Lord comes back to the earth to set up his kingdom on earth. Tribulation saints are not translated to the second coming of Christ, but remain in natural bodies in Isaiah 65, 20 through 25. This would be impossible if all saints were translated at the second coming of earth. The judgment of the Gentiles in Matthew 25, 31 through 46 indicates that both saved and unsaved are still in their natural bodies, which would be impossible if the translation had taken place at the second coming. Likewise, there would be no need of separating the sheep from the goats in Matthew 25, 32. If the translation took place at, at the second coming, for the translation would have already separated them. Benefits of Christ's return. So here's some benefits of Jesus' return. We will see Jesus face to face. The Bible says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And can you imagine the joy that we'll have to see him in person? To see our loved ones as well in person? You and I will be changed. Amen. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall raise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Can you imagine your new supernatural body with new strength, new shape, new teeth? And remember, we're going to eat at the marriage supper of the land, so we're going to need those new choppers. Amen? Bless the Lord. If you've got joints that need repaired, I mean, 
I've got knees that need some help. Amen? My new body, I won't have to worry about bad knees. I won't have to worry about that stuff. Man, we won't have to worry about our hair falling out. Jesus cured us all from in that, you know, death, dandruff, disease, and all that stuff. We're gone. Hallelujah. Can you imagine how wonderful it would be to embrace our parents, children, brothers, sisters, friends, you name it, in heaven? I believe that our hearts will be overwhelmed. And then we'll be rewarded. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Revelation twenty two twelve. Many think that the only thing that matters is that they're saved. And nothing could be further than the truth. There will be great rewards for the faithful. But not everybody in heaven will receive the same reward. Some will sit on thrones, Luke 22, 29 through 30, Revelation 3, 21. While others will be scarcely saved, 1 Peter 4, 18, yes, only as by fire. Kind of like the skin of their teeth. In heaven, some saints will be richly rewarded while others will have their works burned up, 1 Corinthians 3, 14 through 15. So those rewards will be with us forever, forever and ever and ever. But what we do here on earth determines on what happens with our rewards in heaven. It's kind of like a man who was needing a wheelbarrow to work on a construction job. His friend, and this guy was so poor he couldn't afford one, so his friend showed him mercy and gave him his wheelbarrow. That's, that's mercy. And, um, and when he works... It, it, Sorry, whatever he puts in the world, wheelbarrow is what he receives. When he once he receives it, then that's the, the works. Whatever he decides to do with that wheelbarrow, hopefully that made more sense of what it sounded like from my ears. <laughs> I'll work on that one for later. Jesus will judge us for the hungry we feed, for the strangers we take in, the naked we clothe, the people we visit in hospitals. And the people we instruct in the gospel. And these are things we're supposed to be doing. As Bruce and the, the worship team, or who's the, as they come this morning, I want to conclude with this. A pastor was sharing this with her congregation. She said, a few years ago, I had a rapture dream. Just as people were ri ri rising up into the clouds in my dream, I woke up. And it was the middle of the night and pitch black. It had been very cold, and our bedroom felt like an iceberg, so I'd slept alone in the family room near the wood-burning stove with a crackling fire. So when I woke up, I was all alone. I thought, oh, no, I'm still here. And it took me a few minutes to get oriented and realize where I was. I knew I'd been dreaming, but the dream had seemed so real that I couldn't shake the feeling that the rapture had taken place and I had been left behind. I didn't want to wake my husband by going in to check and see if he was still in bed, but I also couldn't stop my heart from feeling like it, was, like it was slamming into my chest wall. I even turned on the TV to see if there had been any reports of missing people. <laughs> Sometimes I wish my dreams wouldn't be so vivid. But here's the truth. One day, it won't be a dream. It will be real. Will you be ready on that day? If you want to be ready, I would encourage you to take the day today to make that start. Be ready to meet the Lord in the air. I'm going to open up the altars this morning. If you need healing in your body, I'll be more than happy to pray with you and, and uh, anoint you with oil. But if there, you've been dealing with something in your life, you're like, yeah, I know that if, if that trumpet were to sound right now, I, I wouldn't make it. Would you take the time now to make things right with the Lord? There is hope in the rapture of the church. There is hope in the word of God. This is good news for each and every one of us. And it helps us when we get into our daily lives, into the daily grind. It gives us something we can look forward to. It gives us a, a hope and a, and, a, and a passion too, not only for the Lord, but also to love what he loves. So would you take the time this morning? If you just want to spend time at the altar, that's fine. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be more than happy to do that. But as Bruce and the worship team lead us in a song, would you come? Please stand with me. Would you come this morning?
Sometimes I'm strong, sometimes I'm weak, sometimes I fall in my wandering. But through it all, there's just one thing more precious than the air I breathe. Rain. Amen. Let's go before the Lord right now. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus and the grace that you've given us. Thank you for saving us, for loving us before we even uh, before we even knew you that you and while we were still in our sins, you loved us and sent Jesus to die for us. We thank you for the soon return of the Lord. And I pray that you would help each and every one of us to live lives that are pleasing unto you. God, I pray for all of us in here that we would live according to your word. And you would uh, encourage us and comfort us. I thank you for your comforting words that someday soon, a trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we will go up before you and, and meet them in the clouds with you to be forever with you. We thank you, Father. Praise you. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat just for a moment. I'm going to ask some uh, new members to come up here to the front. I'm going to ask for Anne Marie Roberts Chai, Ethan O'Shields, and Eddie and um, Babette Horn to come and join me here at the front. You guys can just stand right up here and face the congregation. Come on this way over here. There you go, right here beside me. Over down there, it's fine. Either way. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you, Anne Marie, okay? I'm going to come down here and... Um, I enjoyed having these guys in the, in the membership class and getting to know them better. And Anne-Marie Roberts-Chai joins us from the country of Jamaica. And she's a school teacher down in Manning Junior High. And she lives here in Sumter. She said she doesn't mind the drive. 
She drove that in, in Jamaica as well when you went to work back and forth there. And her hobbies include watching TV and sewing. She makes dresses and uniforms and work clothing as well. And she accepted Christ as Savior at a crusade in Jamaica when she was 17. And since that time, she has done a number of ministries in church, including uh, being a Sunday school teacher, Sunday school superintendent, and being a part of prayer groups and singing with ladies' ministry group. So I want to welcome you to First Assembly of God. You guys should recognize this next fellow right here. Ethan O'Shields, most of you know him and because he's grown up in this church. He works at Chick-fil-A in the mall and is a part of Cornerstone Youth. And uh, Ethan's parents led him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ when he was younger. And then he enjoys art, music, and video games. As part of CSY, he's helped to remodel the children's church room. He's done local missions and been involved, involved in fine arts every year of youth. And including, you've gone at least one time to nationals, right? Yeah. National, okay. So, um, enjoy having you here, Ethan. So, welcome Ethan O'Shields. I'm going to come on this side of you guys here. Now, Ed and Babette are joining us from Frederick, Maryland, but don't let that fool you because they're both from California. And uh, Ed's from San Diego. Babette's from Bakersfield. And Ed's job at Shaw is what brought him here to Sumter. He works in health management, and Babette has the very large task of taking care of Ed. So uh, it's, it's a large one. That's right. And he kept us in stitches, definitely in membership class, and Babette kept him in check. So they have three grown daughters, one of each. That was a joke. It's one of each. All right. I'll, I'll just keep going. Forget that. Yeah. There's Jalen, Jesha, and Jory. And Jalen passed away a few years ago. And in the – Jory, I'm sorry. Jory passed away a few years ago. And in the healing process, the horns have de – they've developed a huge heart for those that are hurting, especially those who have experienced the loss of a child. And not only that, but they're blessed with the gift of hospitality. They both grew up in the church, and uh, Ed came to know Christ – at a Youth for Christ crusade in Kansas City, and Babette received Jesus as a Savior during a VBS, and she's still in touch with her VBS teacher. And that letter to the Lord, I think that's just awesome. And some areas of ministry that Ed has been involved with includes uh, men's Bible group. He's gone through the Seven Pillars by Ted Roberts, the Man in the Mirror series and Sunday school class. And Babette has been part of the women's ministry, leading Bible studies. She's been on committees to put together conferences and retreats for women's ministry. So I want to welcome you guys to First Assembly of God. Now it's official. That's right. Church, would you please stand with me? And we're going to create a receiving line from this side over. Shake their hands, hug their necks, and then you'll be dismissed. And we'll see you tonight for small groups.